The big fights you've craved Good night. are back. Here we go. Tonight, live and free on Paramount Network, two of Bellator's top bantamweight contenders, Sergio Pettis and Ricky Bandejas, battle to earn their shot at the title. Plus, two of MMA's human highlight reels, Aaron Pico and Taiwan Claxton return to the cage. It's good to be back. Bellator MMA, live tonight at 10 on Paramount Network. not normal we now try to give you a little normalcy 134 days ago we stood in this very same mohegan sun arena we try to give you a fight but because of the pandemic we're all asked to leave as a result of safety 134 days later we are back and we have a title eliminator fight headlining our card sergio pettis against ricky bandejas we are proud to give you live fights here for Bellator Mixed Martial Arts. Hi, everybody. Welcome into our arena. I'm your host, Jay Glazer, joined by my man, my dude, the one and only American gangster, Chael P. Son and Chael, like I said, nothing is normal, but it is so good to be back here. We've lived the quarantine life. Now we give you some fights. Jay, I have always liked you, but I got to tell you, I've never <laughs> missed you so much, partner. And I am thrilled to see you. And by the way, quick shout out to Scott Coker, because this is the finest setup that I've ever seen for fighting. It really is. And by the way, you look fantastic. I don't know what you did in the quarantine. Well, you know. You look fantastic. Right. See, this is how much it's changed us. I opened the show complimenting you. Yes, be you know, nice. Here, here's the one thing I will tell you about this, the, the virus, though. Man, there are places in this country that actually charge $10,000 a week to get us all to disconnect, unplug, and spend some time with our families. We got to do that for free this time. I hope we all appreciated that time off. What did you do with your time that you had? I watched every TV show there was, Jay. Some <laughs> of them I've even watched twice. I can't give you a good recommendation. I got to tell you that, but I'm I'm open to I'm open to hearing one. Uh, you, you, you are, I got a great one for you. It's called Bellator MMA. Boom. Yeah, we had a whole library on the YouTube, YouTube channel, on our uh, on our app, everything. We also have a great card tonight. Man, if you like matchups, this is the card for you. And it finishes up with Sergio Pettis against Ricky Bandejas. Winner of that will fight for the Bantamweight Championship of the World. I want to bring in now our commentators at the desk. Boys, how are you guys doing? Look at this. We're complimenting each other up here. I'm going to say two of you guys look fantastic <laughs> after the quarantine. You guys fight it out for who it is. Well, and I'm going to tell you that Chael is being kind, Jay, but he loves social distancing at the desk. He loves being six, seven, eight, maybe nine feet away from you, even though you are very good friends. Shot Thompson, big John McCarthy. We have the big fight, Ricky Bandejas. Sergio Pettis, the winner of that fight, will be next in line to battle for the Bellator Bantamweight bout. But we also have Aaron Pico on the card. And Josh, we are being told a new and improved and more mature Aaron Pico. Yeah, we're getting that information directly from him. And he's talking to us about how he's matured, how he really didn't know the sport when he exploded on the scene. And I got to tell you, I believe him. But the questions have to be answered in the cage. It doesn't matter what I believe. It doesn't matter what he says. I need to see it in that cage. Uh, you're absolutely right. But you've got to admit, came into the sport at the age of 20. After all those years of wrestling, because he was a superstar, he was an Olympic alternate, and he didn't know the sport. But now, with the camp that he's at, he's learning the transitions. He's learning to relax. And I think we're going to see a completely different fighter in Aaron Pico. And obviously, Big John, really high expectations because of the life that Aaron Pico has lived, because he has been competing since he was around eight years old all around the world. And speaking of a man who has competed in the sport of mixed martial arts for a very long time, the Canadian. Lethbridge, Alberta, Canada's Jordan Meehan will make his Bellator debut tonight against Jason Jackson. And I'll tell you what, Taiwan Claxton and J.J. Wilson, a tremendous fight. And of course, we talked about Aaron Pico, his opponent, Solo Hatley Jr. That will be our first fight on the main card that is coming up in a little bit over one hour but we start our preliminary action with a heavyweight confrontation a man that Chael Sonnen knows very well in Rudy Scaffrock and he will welcome the Jamaican Shamrock to the Bellator cage 
And now, ladies and gentlemen, your first fighter of the evening ready to make his way to the cage. This is Ras Hilton. Thank you, my fucking thing. Three days notice for the Jamaican Shamrock Raz Hilton replacing Steve Mowry. He has scored all five of his career victories by knockout. He uses a lot of motion. He wants to come in and get this fight finished quickly because obviously he didn't have a lot of time to prepare for this fight, but he can make the most of it if he can finish his opponent, Rudy Scafroth, here tonight in our first preliminary matchup. And now his opponent ready to make his way to the cage record, Rudy Shafra. There's a man going around. I guess, Big John, you can say you're going to be the man who knocks your opponent out or the man whose opponent knocked you out because Rudy has finished all six wins in the first round and five of those by knockout. Look at one of the things we know about Rudy Shafroth, Mike, is he has got big power in his hands. He's a very good wrestler. He came from a wrestling background, but he loves to stand and knock people out. That's what he's going to try to do tonight against Raz Hill. And the terror in each sip and in each Our tail of the tape for our first preliminary matchup brought to you by Boost Mobile's all new Shrink It Plan, a brand new way to mobile. Six and one, Rudy Shaproth against five and four, Raz Hilton, who will have a five inch reach advantage. With the official introductions, here is Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening and welcome to Bellator 242 as tonight we're back at Mohegan Sun Arena. As we get the action underway, we welcome all those joining us around the world live on Bellator's YouTube channel as we kick off the prelims with three five-minute rounds in the heavyweight division. Introducing the blue corner first at six foot six, weighing in 247.4 pounds. His professional record, five wins, four losses, fighting out of South Portland, Maine, presenting Rasquatch, the Jamaican Shamrock, Ras Hilton. And across the cage, his adversary fighting out of the red corner at six foot four, weighing in 259.9 pounds as a professional. Six victories, just one defeat, fighting out of Clackamas, Oregon. Introducing Wrecked Rudy Shafra. In charge of the action, your referee, Brian Miner. Brian Miner, our referee for this heavyweight matchup as we are back. Rudy Shafron and Raz Hilton. Man, Ready? guys, I've been waiting for this. Here we go. Tonight's fight clock brought to you by Geico. Red gloves for Shafron, blue gloves for Hilton. He'll switch his stance. He is a natural southpaw. Rudy Shafron, a southpaw. Rudy Shafron already landed a big left hand right in the middle of Raz Hilton's face, he's got to be careful of the power of Shafra. You can see that Raz Hilton comes from a traditional karate background, that Shotokan karate background. He's trying to be elusive, light on his feet. It's a nice little inside leg kick, kind of kept Shafra loyal back to his stance. Second degree black belt in Shotokan karate. Also, when he's landing those kicks, he's got a size 20 foot, Mike, so it, he doesn't have to get quite as close as other guys. Not quite Shaquille O'Neal, but he'd give him a little battle. They're going at it early, no surprise here. Both men have a ton of knockouts in their professional career. And that's what Raz wants to do, Josh, is switch the stance and move and avoid and then try to attack when he finds the opening that Rudy may allow him to have. 
Well, Raz is doing really well as he's keeping that left hand guard up. He's, he must have saw something in the shaft cross pass fights that he likes to throw that overhand. See that little short right hook that he's throwing? Yep. And Raz is keeping that left hand geared to his, his ear. Very nicely done. Two first round knockout victories for Rudy Shafroth in his first two Bellator appearances, then suffered his first career loss at the hands of Tyrell Fortune. You can see how Rudy Shafroth, when he comes in closer, he's actually cutting an angle, making Raz step towards his power in his left hand. Those low level leg kicks though, John, are making a huge difference on how Rudy is approaching this fight. I th you're right, I think the low level calf kick that Raz is employing is starting to just cause Rudy that problem and he doesn't have that solid base to stand on. Oh, big oh, shot. He got rocked. Cover, Raz, cover, cover, this could cover. be it. There you go, time up. Big time shot up. by Rudy. Oh. And now Raz Hilton out, has out, to deal out. with Rudy Shafroth. Keep that half lock. Keep that this half is an area where I believe Rudy has a big advantage in this fight. His wrestling is actually very good. He's very heavy on top, and he's going to move himself right out of that half guard position. Now he's still in it, but he was looking to move out of it either to side control. He tried to step over almost to mount. What had happened is Raz was kind of lunging in on some of his punches previous to this knockdown. There's that mount. He saw that positioning happen. Rudy saw that positioning happen. He was able to step in, land a nice shot, and dropped him. Bad spot for Raz Hilton here. Full mount for Rudy Shaproth. And you can be in this position like you're seeing Raz with his hands. All you're going to see Rudy do once he decides that I'm comfortable with what is occurring with the legs here, he's going to start to frame out. And he's going to break that position with the hands. Back to half guard. What Raz needs to do is go low with that, with that left underhook. He grabs low on that left underhook. So he grabs it all the way around the waist and use him to scoot out on that side. Rudy's looking. He was looking for an arm triangle choke. Just slid it past, but he was trying. And John, the one submission win of his professional career was by arm triangle choke. Big guys love the arm triangle because it's a strength maneuver and it's fairly easy if you pressure your head in the right position to get that, get that weight on top. Your weight creates the choke. It's a risk reward. It's yeah. a risk reward. There's there's really no risk if you lose the position. You end up in side control. You end up on their back if they try to roll away. So there really is no danger for going for that submission. 40 seconds on the clock. Round number one. 40 seconds. There you go. There you go. Keep it tied. Keep it tied up. They traded strikes. Some low kicks landed by Hilton. Don't give him anything. But Rudy with top position for the last minute and a half. Yeah, and when you're Rudy Shafroth in this position, he's trying to create a pressure. Look at that shoulder, where the shoulder is at. He's putting pressure oh, towards the chin area and the neck of Raz. But this is where he has a position where he can do damage. He needs to look towards doing damage. Don't look towards controlling. Yeah, but that also on the take with Raz, he has a chance and opportunity to get out from this guard position because he has the left side underhook. So all he's got to do is keep trying to scoot out to that side. He could potentially get to the back. Well, he'll be on his feet, start of round number two. Here's the knockdown. When Rudy comes in, you're seeing that left hand touches, but the right hand's the one that actually puts him down. Doesn't have a ton of power on it, but it was enough with the balance to put Raz Hilton on his butt. That was a big reason why Raz was keeping that left hand in, up tight onto his ear. Yep. The exchange didn't work. He got caught up in the exchange and dropped, let it drop, and it caught him behind the ear. Raz needs to know if he ends up on his back, he has to do things to get himself back to his feet if he wants to win this fight. Three days notice for Raz Hilton. He has fought twice here in 2020. Both fights back in February. A second round knockout victory and a defeat by second round rear naked choke. Making his Bellator debut, trying to send a message to everyone that he should be on the Bellator roster. Round two. Blue gloves for Hilton, red gloves for Rudy Shaproth. I like what he's doing right here, right back to the inside leg kick. Setting the tempo right away, I'm gonna go right to it. It's gonna keep 
Shafroth away, as well as not being able to set down on the punches they may potentially drop him. Just like you saw Shafroth throwing that straight left. Anytime you see Raz throwing that inside leg kick, Rudy should step forward and unleash that straight left. Talked about the significant reach advantage for Raz Hilton. He'll try to use that and those low leg kicks. And as Josh pointed out, keep that left hand pinned to his ear. What I want to see from Razo is I want to see him use a little bit more of his reach. He just talked about his reach, but he's kind of still stepping in too close to be countered by Shafroff. Everything is, an, is about an understanding of distance control, and there's that just that couple of inches that you want to come in, especially when you're the guy that has the length that Raz has, don't come all the way in and put yourself in a position for your opponent to counter. Yeah, you hear it all the time, the crushing the distance, you hear keeping distance control, you hear it in boxing all the time as well when they talk about boxing as a matter of inches, millimeters, centimeters. It's because all you need to do is miss a punch by a certain amount. And right now, Raz is putting himself in that position where he's getting a little bit too close on those inside leg kicks. And when he was knocked down was when Rudy Shafroth was able to get inside and land that overhand. The veteran Jordan Meehan on the main card later tonight making his Bellator debut. When he was asked what his greatest strength is as a fighter, he said, Josh, distance control. That comes with experience. Yep. Yeah. High level experience, you start to you start to get that by who you train with, who you fight with. That's why they say iron sharpens iron. That when you're in that cage or you're in the in the room with your partners training, getting ready for fights, they teach you who your opponent is on they keep that distance, teaching you how to regulate the distance. <laughs> Round one, Big John, 10-9 to Rudy. No doubt about it. Rudy Shafroth gets that round 10-9, but you can see Rudy's a little bit, he's tired. You know, I don't know if it's the, the camp is different because of everything that's been going on, but he is pushing his punches instead of snapping those punches. That usually is done when someone is fatigued. I'm also going to say that leg kicks, even though they, they don't land like they kick like punches, they still take a lot out of you. There's not no bounce in your step. You know, if you notice when people get tired, right, what's the first thing they do? They start bouncing around, trying to get their energy back. He's not able to do that, slowing him down. He's basically just trying to walk and stalk after Raz now. And every time that he's throwing, though, he's throwing hard, which takes energy. And this is officially the longest fight of Rudy Shafroth's career. <laughs> The previous length, seven minutes and eight seconds, that was the loss to Tyrell Fortune. Even that jab work and give me some pressure behind the jab. And if Rudy's not pressuring Big John, then he's giving the Jamaican Shamrock an advantage. Even though he comes in on three days notice, he's, if you will, letting him off the hook a little bit. That sounds so strange, the Jamaican Shamrock. Yeah, yeah but that is, <laughs> is his name. And yeah, you're absolutely right by allowing Raz to have freedom of movement and control of that distance, which really he's the one kind of controlling the distance. It's giving Raz the opportunity to land those leg kicks, to land that jab, and to just pick Rudy apart with shots. But he's got to do more. He's got to give me more volume right now. What, what John left out is he's giving him confidence. Yes, He's true. able to move around. He's able to stick and move. He's able to land what he needs to land and get out. That's the confidence going to build him up to potentially win this round and go on into the third round. And if you're taking a fight on three days' notice, Josh, in the back of your mind, you're thinking, all right, I've got two minutes, maybe two and a half minutes where I can really let things go. And so what Raz Hilton would like to do is get to that point, get to the middle of the third and final round, and then really look for a finish. What it also does is it takes a lot of pressure off. I gotta be honest, like you come in well rested. <laughs> Especially in the heavyweight division, you come in rested, your body hasn't gone through a full camp, you're ready to go. Now you, you know what you can do if you've been training, which it looks like he has been. His footwork and his movement is fantastic. You know, he got clipped in the first round, but I gotta tell you, in this second round, he's the one doing all the aggressive movements. Sure, he's sticking and moving, but he's the one landing on the strikes. And John, you can see it's very visible that Rudy is struggling here in round two with his gas tank. Yeah, there's no doubt, you know, when you are that guy that, you know, you've only gotten used to fighting one round fights. It is not easy when you're getting into that second, late second and third round, which he's gonna now enter.
Back up, back up, back up. Good. Last round. Last round. Scroll. Fight. Third and final round. Not a whole lot happened in that last five minutes, John. So what went on in the judges' mind? I think in the judges' mind, they saw one big shot by Shafroth that, that moved uh, Raz Hilton, but they saw volume output by Raz Hilton. He was hitting him with little inside leg kicks, little push kicks, some with his hands. I think they gave it to Raz Hilton. I think this round is the one that's going to decide this fight. Four and a half minutes here as we return inside the Bellator cage, starting with our first of three preliminary fights. And then some great matchups on the main card. Raz Hilton needs to immediately, when he sees Rudy coming in like he is, when he makes that, that charge, stop taking steps backwards and make steps either left or right, start to circle out. He's giving Rudy a chance to land that shot just based upon stepping straight back. I think what we're underestimating here, John, though, is that the fact that the opponent change is a completely different opponent. True. You know, so coming in, this is not the style that Rudy was probably training for on short day, on short term notice. Like these type of fights, these are fights that make you tired. These are fights you got to train for. Someone that moves a lot, how to learn how to cut the cage off. Those are things that a lot of fighters sometimes don't work on in camp because they're expecting just to walk forward and let's get after it. This is a different style of fight. This is true. That's very true. Oh, Rudy falls down. So Josh, to the point we were making in the second round, if you're Raz Hilton, at what point, at what time on the clock do you really start to let go? It's not even so much that. He's doing what he needs to do to win. I think he won the second round. I agree with John. I also think he just got to keep doing what he's doing. I think more of the pressure is on Shafrock because he had a full camp. He's been ready to fight. Sure, the opponent changed. The style changed. Everything changed. But you still got to go out there and get it done. And right now, he's not getting it done. <laughs> That's good, good. Uppercut good. on the inside. Frank's Raz is doing a great down. job sticking and moving, getting in, getting out. He's got to be careful. He's lunging a little bit too much, and that's what got him in trouble in the first round. I just saw it right there again. Yep, got caught. This is what he should have done right from the beginning of the third round. Or from the beginning of the second round. This is the difference that I said that Rudy Shafroth has a huge advantage in the fact that he came from a good wrestling background. He can wrestle, he can take you down, and he can maintain that top position. So this is a smart move by Rudy. Wrestled and played football at Portland State. Also played rugby with the Portland Pigs. Started training in MMA with Matt Lindland. Matt the Law Lindland, and of course, a member of American Top Team Portland. And a good buddy of our own American gangster, Chael P. Sun. This is the time that Raz needs to just commit to getting back to his feet. If he's got energy in the tank, now's when he's got to use it because if he ends up staying on his back, it's going to be a bad position for him to be. Get back to your feet. Get back to what you do best. And in the first round, John, Raz was happy to control the posture of Rudy. That will not be enough here with a minute and 35 seconds on the clock. I think part of the reason that Raz did what he did in the first round is he was worried about the gas tank and that he hadn't trained for a full fight so he didn't know what was going to be there now that he's in this third round why leave anything in that tank go for it yep what Raz needs to do is get rid of that holding the head. He needs to stop holding the head. He's the post on his right hand get that and under start him. working himself back to his feet. When he grabbed the head like that, he automatically went to his back flat to the ground. The last place you want to be is with your back flat to the ground, especially with someone like Shaf up on top. Rudy looking to grind it out with under a minute remaining. But John, I'm, I'm going to get into it right now with you. This right now is not winning the round. No, because if you what you're seeing right now, Raz has landed, we'll say uh, in the last little bit, eight shots. How many has Rudy landed? None. Well, watch the back here of the comes Moore. He's got to watch the back of the head. But Rudy has also not gone for any type of submission. No difference in the position change. Right now, he's holding. He's trying to control. He's letting the clock run by. And if he continues to do this, I think the judges are going to give this round to Razzo. You can see the damage on Shaft Frost's knee on the inside of those leg, those leg kicks. You see that damage, and you see him working for Kimura right now. He's been landing the elbows. He's been doing the most 
most damage in this round. That's the whole point is right now at least Raz Hilton is doing things trying to finish the fight. What has Rudy done? Nothing. Other than get the takedown, which should lead you into more things. He hasn't done anything with it. He'd already lost the momentum from the second round. So the takedown is something he should have done in the second round and then into the third round as well. And John pointed out, and Josh, I know you agree, that the busier man, even though he was on bottom in round number three, was Raz Hill. Yeah, not only was he the busier man, but just the movement and the strikes that he landed in the third round were the more significant strikes. I have this conversation with John all the time, best referee in, since the beginning of the sport, and then a former fighter myself. We have these conversations of what are you looking for? And, what, and this is exactly what they're looking for, guys that land the more significant strikes. So I'm hoping, this, I'm hoping to see the right guy get the decision. So you talked to John and you also talked to the best referee yeah, in both, history of both, both of those guys. Both guys, all right. <laughs> all right, the official decision is him, and here is Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, having gone the distance, we'll go to your three judges at cage side. All three, Doug Crosby, Dave Peabody, Eric Cologne, seat exactly the same, 29 to 28. All have it for the winner by unanimous decision. Rasquatch, the Jamaican Shamrock, Raz Hilton. Congratulations, Raz Hilton. And you guys called it unanimous decision victory, 29-28 on all three scorecards. All right, let's get back to Jay and Chip. All right, thanks, Goldie. Hey, you get an opportunity in a couple days' notice. You come in, you make the most of that opportunity. Congratulations there on a win. Hey, tonight, our main event, it's for the chance to fight for the Bantamweight Championship of the World when Juan Archuleta and Patrick Mix will eventually fight. Winner of this fight gets the winner of that for the title, Sergio Pettis, Ricky Mendez. Ricky Mendez, man, this guy has a couple of highlight reel knockouts. Very unorthodox fighter. Yeah, Jay, I love that you call him unorthodox. There's no position, it appears, where he's not willing to fight from. By example, a guy has his leg in a fight one time, okay? Instead of Ricky thinking, oh, no, he has my leg, he looks at it differently and goes, no, no, I have your hands. Your hands are now busy, and he starts teeing off. The guy will fight you from everywhere. Jay, you're not going to talk him out of it. You're not going to push him in the fence or get on top of him. He's going to try to punch you in the face the entire time. And nothing's too big for him. Look, he took on a fight against James Gallagher, and he obviously upset James Gallagher out there in his first fight for Bellator. But he takes on Sergio Pettis. So last time Sergio Pettis fought, he had a big submission here, put somebody down, and obviously finished them with the uh, guillotine. But Sergio Pettis seems like he's been fighting since about two months old. Yeah, no, and that's exactly right. I think he has. Don't forget, Sergio is the little brother of Anthony Pettis, a former world champion. Imagine, Jay, you're a rough guy. But every day of your life, there's somebody in the house who's a little bit tougher. That's going to do a couple of things for you, most importantly teach you to deal with high-pressure situations. Look, Jay, it does appear the bigger the fight for both of these athletes, the more they step up. Look, this is going to be fireworks. This is going to be a dogfight. It's whoever gets to the target first. Yeah, matchup wise, it is a fantastic contest. For more on this fight, let's bring in our own Jam Brown. Jen, hello. 
Hello, Jay. Well, thank you. You know, fighting during a pandemic, there's a lot of adjustments that need to be made to keep our fighters safe. We've got testing, quarantines, temperature checks, all new things that they had to expi experience this week. Now, tonight, though, the biggest change for them is going to be the atmosphere, of course, because there is no crowd. And you have to wonder, is that going to have an impact on some of these fighters, right? Because some guys, they tell us, they feed off of that crowd energy, and it gets them to be better, where others may crumble under that pressure. Now, Sergio Pettis, we talked to him, and he said, look, there's nothing different for me when I fight. I don't even hear the crowds. Now, Ricky Mendeja said crowd or no crowd, he is feeling some extra pressure tonight because this is the first time he's ever headlined a Bellator card. Now, Goldie, uh, one thing, though, you have to take into consideration, Sergio Pettis has been in this atmosphere before. Remember, he told us that he cornered his brother in his fight against Donald Cerrone back in May, so it might give him maybe a little bit of an edge tonight. Jen, thank you very much, and Showtime looked outstanding in that fight. Up next, a bantamweight battle. Raphael Stotts and the mean green fighting machine, Cass Bell. And now, ready to make his way to the cage, the mean green fighting machine, Cass Bell. Five and oh record, all five of those wins inside the Bellator cage. Saw him earlier today, Josh, and he had, well, he had a mask on, but I could tell he had a smile on his face under the mask. Excited to be here like we all are. Happy to be back, and he wants to put on a show once again. I gotta tell you, he's probably the most underrated guy we have on, on this card tonight. Somebody that somebody always overlooks. When we talk about other fights, he's always the guy that, that we bring in. And it doesn't seem like people want him to win, or he doesn't, he's not on that top part. I gotta tell you, his size and his experience, he's gonna be explosive tonight. Caspell. And now making his way to the cage, Rafael Superstar. We have talked a lot already about our main event of the evening featuring Sergio Pettis. Well, Supa, Rafael Stats, a teammate of Anthony and Sergio Pettis, Emmanuel Sanchez, trained by the great Duke Rufus, Daniel Vanderlei, and Coach Kush, Scott Cushman. Our tale of the day, brought to you by Boost Mobile's all-new Shrink It Plan, a brand new way to mobile. 13 and one Stotts, five and O oh Bell Stotts will have the reach advantage, even though he is three inches shorter. Here's Michael C. Williams. From Mohegan Sun Arena, the Bellator 242 prelims now go to the bantamweight division. Set for three five minute rounds, introducing the blue corner first at five foot ten, weighing in 135.2 pounds, undefeated as a professional. He brings five victories, no defeats, fighting out of Humboldt County, California. The mean green fighting machine, Castell. And across the cage is adversary fighting out of the red corner at five foot seven, weighing in 135.6 pounds. His professional record near perfect. 13 wins, just one defeat by way of Houston, Texas. He fights out of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Rafian Superstars. In charge, your referee, Brian Miner. Brian Miner, the referee for this bantam weight fight. 13 and 1 Stotts, 5 and 0 oh, Bell. Stotts victorious in Hawaii, his first fight on the big Rafael, stage. You rich? Has Cash Bell you ready? also oh. fought in Hawaii in front of the troops and won by unanimous decision. Blue gloves for Cass Bell, red gloves for Rafion Stotts. Tonight's fight clock brought to you by Geico. Big takedown. Big takedown, but he is caught in a guillotine right now. That is a tight guillotine. It's just a matter of what squeeze is Rafion Stotts putting on him right now. If he starts to extend with that foot, keeping that back down, he can get this choke. And John, you like the grappling skills of Stotts. I love the grappling skills of Rafion. He is fantastic. You're talking about a two-time NC2A champion. This guy can wrestle. His jujitsu is fantastic. Cass Bell 
is very underrated. Like Josh said, he's got good wrestling, not quite as uh, experienced or has the credentials that Rafian Stotz says, but it's good and it's great for MMA. The simple fact of the matter is, is that Cass Bell always comes in. Things like this happen early in the fight. It feels like he gets a rhythm and a roll going. He fights at a very unorthodox pace. He just keeps the pressure and keeps going. And as fighters continue to fight him throughout the fight, they don't. They start to wilt under the pressure, and he gets on top of you. He starts putting pressure. When he pokes his head out here, you can expect some explosiveness or some activity that sometimes fighters are not aware of. It's it's interesting because you can see that Rafion has never really put pressure on this choke. He's never extended and squeezed with his arms, which is going to tire his arms out. And Caspell has just been relaxed and taking his time and saying, "Okay, I'm good. As long as I'm good, I can stay here all day." Nice move by Rafael Stotts to get his hips out. John mentioned the two-time Division II National Wrestling Champion Stotts wrestled at the University of Nebraska Kearney, the same school as Kamaru Usman. Top of the hour, our main card live on Paramount Network and our main event, Stotts teammates Sergio Pettis and Ricky Bandejas. Great wrist control by Caspell. Nice Cass two Bell. on one by Caspell to control that, that arm. He knows by controlling it, he can get himself back to the center position. Nice job by Cass. Stoss tried to hit that little foot sweep on the turn back. Midway point, uh, round number one. We heard the corner of Bell talking about the hands got to be, the arms got to be a little tired. Uh, Rafian Stotts. I don't think so because we never saw him really bear down and try to go after that choke. So I don't think his arms are tired. This is when you get two guys that are technically outstanding. You'll get these little gamesmanships. It's a chess match. And, you know, just because I move that piece doesn't mean that I'm just leaving it out there to, for someone to take. Lift, lift, lift. Come up into the clinch. Yeah. I'm going to chain if you need to. That position. That position, get up. Five fight win streak for Stotts. 5 0 record for 33 year old Cass Bell. Three wins by submission, one by knockout. Cass Bell's got a sneaky little guillotine that he likes to use where he pulls it all the way through and pushes on that fist. Calls it the Castle Team. Castle Team, there yeah. you go, man. <laughs> And he's good with it, and when you'll see him set, he's, he started to set it up and then he let go of it with his hands, you can see. But he's quick. Once he goes for it, it's on tight, man. You've got to be careful and be defensive against that. Well, a lot of the problem is, is see how Rafael starts hanging his head on the outside. This is where he sets it up. Caspell sets yep. it up right in this position. He'll use this head and arm guillotine choke position to get to a hook sweep. As you see him setting up, see that left hook on the inside of Rafael Stott's thigh? He's going to look to try to hook sweep him and get to the top position and put pressure. He is, and you can see he's doing the same thing that Rafael Stotts did. He has never really committed to squeezing on that neck tight. We've never seen him clinch down, start to bring everything in tight. It's never occurred. He's just, I'll control you here, and I'll see if that opportunity comes, but I'm not going to just go toward it. Not gonna burn my arms out on something that I can't finish. Exactly. 30 seconds on the clock, round number one. For those of you guys at home watching this, what Stotts needs to do is keep his head above Cass Bell's head or just underneath the chin, somewhere in that range where he can't, his head can't nice be pushed move. in. Nice job getting the mount. Very nice move, smoothly moves to mount. Little mistake by Cass that led him step over. He's only got 10 seconds. He should try to do some damage here. There you go. There you go. Back and forth, first five minutes of this fight. Really good technical round by both fighters. I saw you on the ice. I saw you on the ice. Give me a few deep Get a little ice back. The corner of Cass Bell. His head coach, John Thompson, also known as Master Splinter. Very nice of John Thompson to look at his fighter, be honest with him. And Josh and I talk about this all the time. Don't sit there and say, it's a close round. We, you might have gotten, no, you lost that round, which he did. 
So let's start working towards what are we going to do better in the second round to get this back. But we always talk about also, Caspell admitted that he lost that round. And that makes it easier when you're up front with your corner to say, yep, you're right. True. You're telling your fighter something that's not real, like, oh, you're doing great, then you're just doing them an injustice. <laughs> Goldie, you're doing a great job. Thank you. Oh, oh well played. One. one nothing. The pump. <laughs> But it's a long night, Josh. That was a 9.5. That wasn't bad at all. It wasn't Nadia Komenich, but it was close. Round two. And they tangle early. Oh, oh nice got off hand by Caspell. Yep. Answered by Stotts, Josh. Yep, absolutely. Stotts hit him with a good shot, but that was a good counter left. Stotts still stayed right in the middle. Guy has him up against the cage. Knee under. Knee those legs. Yep, knee beat the legs up. And after the honest assessment in between rounds, you saw Cass Bell come out with a lot more vigor and a lot more of an attack mode, although now the grappling continues. You see Stotts trying to lace that arm. See, about the, see how he's got his arm behind his back? He was controlling that left arm of Cass Bell from behind. But like I was saying at the end of the first round, Stoss needs to avoid that guillotine by putting his forehead and his his head underneath the chin of right Castell. And I've got to give some love to my good buddy, who I once called Little Eagle, even though he's Little Evil. Stotts began his mixed martial arts training with Chen's Pulver, who's like a big brother to him. Also spent a lot of time with the Croatian sensation, our buddy Pat Milicic. Now a member of Duke Rufus's team. He's been in Milwaukee for five years as a member of Team Rufus Sport. So what he's doing here, what I like that he's doing here, is he's using his footwork as well. So it's not just wrestling that he's using. He's inside tripping. He's trying to kick the feet out from underneath them. That opens up the knees. So when Caspell gets broken off balance, he throws the knee right up to the to the body or to the head or wherever he wants to throw it, but it's, it, it makes it easier to land those shots when someone's trying to recover their balance. But he's in on those hips now, and he had his hands together and then let them go, so he felt something. There we go. Nice takedown by Rafael Stotts. Picks him up, amplitude, slams him down. So what he did was he had his hands locked to make sure it brought Caspell's legs a little bit closer together. He unlocked him and shot his hips in and lifted him. Nicely done. During these unprecedented and challenging times, the safety of our staff, crew, and fighters has never been more paramount. And Bellator is proud to have partnered with the fine men and women at Hartford Healthcare. These dedicated medical professionals have been overseeing not only our testing and screening, but all medical aspects of our event. For more information, go to hartfordhealthcare.org. Rafion Stutz trying to get the back, and that was a beautiful job by Cass Bell to be relaxed, take control of that foot, keep his hand from allowing that foot to hook inside and stay hooked. Nice step back inside with that hook by Rafion Stutz. These guys are just playing a high-level chess game, Josh. Yeah, that's very gonna, nice. I was going to say that. <laughs> Stole your I mind really without was. even knowing. There you go. <laughs> well, let's get it on. <laughs> now we're even. <laughs> See? I was, great. You're doing a great job. I was never going to say that. No. No, you and you've never said it before. Turn into him, Kevin. You got it. What Rafion, there you go. What I want to say, Rafion needs to get up a little bit higher. He needs to get his shoulders up and over, and he needs to get ear to ear with Cass Bell. The more that he can center his hips on the hips of Cass Bell, the more dangerous he'll become in that position. He's a little, I got to tell you, he's a little high right now until he just broke Caspell down. He needs to get that other hook in now. He's got the opportunity. Nope. Cas closed that off. But it was nice how Rafael kicked case, himself Cass. back to make sure his hips got back as well. Stotts, a brown belt in Brazilian jiu-jitsu under Daniel Vanderlei. But let's talk a little bit about that camp. At Duke Rufus's camp there with all those guys there, you got Pettis, you got Sergio Pettis, you got Anthony's brother, Anthony Pettis, you've got Emmanuel Sanchez. All those guys have excelled so much within the last two or three years. Their grappling has just escalated to a whole other level that I've seen. Their coach is doing a wonderful job with them, and you're seeing it right now with Rafael Stotts. Duke Rufus is the kind of leader 
who has the confidence and the lack of ego and surrounds himself with other great leaders like Daniel Vanderlei and Coach Cush, Scott Cushman. And that's why we've seen the success. Paul Felder has spent some time training there. Of course, Ben Askren spent time in Milwaukee at Rufus Sport. Duke has been around this game for a long, long time. So what Cass needs to do is go two hands on that wrist and take it up and over his head so he can turn and face him. 15 seconds on the clock, round number two. He can also take and use that cage, almost like it's a cheese grater, to scrape Rafion into a position that doesn't allow his back to be exposed, and he can come into it. I'm kind of like his own hype man. I love yeah, it. That's, that's it. <laughs> I love it. I'm gonna, I don't need the crowd. I'll hype myself up. Do it, Rafael. Second out. His only loss was over three years ago. He got caught by a spinning back fist 15 seconds into the fight. Other than that, perfect. Ready? Ready? And he looks to remain unbeaten inside the Bellator cage, as does Cass Bell. Third and final round. Red gloves for Stotts, blue gloves for Bell. This is going to be interesting because Cass Bell has never been in this position. I, I have him down two rounds in, in this fight, and he's never been in a position where he's been down like that in a fight. We're going to see how he responds. I think what you're seeing is just the fluidity of striking. Caspell's loading up with the strikes, and Rafiana's is making him miss just a tiny bit. Slipped the, slipped the punch, got right to the body lock, able to jump to the back and get the hooks in, doing some nice damage right now. Beautiful control. As you're seeing, uh, not only has he landed the big strikes like you're talking about, it's the control with his hips and his legs, keeping himself in a position to do that damage because Cass was moving well. Rafian Stotts is showing that, you know what, his, his grappling as far as MMA grappling is just getting better and better. What he's doing is he's holding that far wrist control, so he's pulling it across Caspell's body so he can't actually spin back into him to try and defend the strikes. You can tell the hip pressure by Rafian Stotts is an extremely tough. Here he is right on the neck. Can he get it? Uh, he's in trouble with this, Mike. That is tight. Trying to finish it right here, right now. Cass is done. And it's all over! Stop. Rafael Stotts moves to 14 and 1, 2 and 0 inside the Bellator King. Once again, a win by Rear Naked Choke. Hey, man. I appreciate you, man. Peace. Four wins by submission, all with the same move. Kaz Bell defeated for the first time in his professional career. I am confident and fearless in all that. Watch when, see that Josh talking about that wrist control and then boom, explodes, sneaks that arm across, gets the lock on behind, that is tight right there. And Cass is doing nothing to get that lock off. And when you don't go to get that lock off, Josh, you know it's one, one of two things. It's either you're going to tap or you're going to go with a nap. Gonna nap. <laughs> what I liked is how he had actually originally had set this whole thing up. He was able to slip the punch, got to the body lock, jumped right to the hooks, got to this position here. But how he set that choke up was very nice. He got Caspell distracted with the wrist control. And as soon as Caspell started fidgeting with the wrist, he jumped right to the neck. To make it official, here is Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, inside the Bellator cage, the tap comes one minute, 24 seconds into round number three by way of a rear naked choke. He's the winner by submission, Rafihan Superstar. 
Submission victory in the third round for Supa Rabion Stats as we get it back up to Jay and Jay. Great show there is Josh talking about two from great camp. Welcome back to the desk here in the Mohegan Sun Arena. Jay Glazer, Chael P. Sun, and then our co-main event tonight, Jason Jackson, Jordan Meehan. And before Twitter world goes crazy here, it is Jordan Meehan, according to him. Not Jordan Meehan, but, man, he's been around forever and ever. Fought in Strike Force UFC. Now he makes his Bellator debut. But this guy got his start as a 16-year-old fighting who? Rory McDonald. Wow, yes. Uh, 41 fights, he said, Jay. By the way, he's only 30 years old. I'll right. tell you that because if you follow the sport, you think, well, Jordan's been around forever. Yeah, that's true because to your point, he started at 16. Look, he's not belted, actually. He is a ground fighter. His father is a two-strike black belt. I bring this up because he never got into the traditional martial arts into a belt. He always got into the mixed martial arts. As great as he is on the ground, officially, he's a white belt. All right, well, Jason Jackson here. Look, it says 2-1 Bellator record. That was a fight against Ed Ruth, which we all thought he defeated Ed Ruth, which is quite a, a, a feat to defeat a guy like Ed Ruth, but Jason Jackson, this guy brings the heat. Yeah, look, if you go 15 minutes with Ed Ruth, you're a tough guy. If you had a close match, he did all of that and a little bit more, in all fairness, and Jay, he looks like he's carved out of stone. Most guys like this to trade in life. You don't always have the conditioning. Like, like me. Like you. Thank no, you. Precise. Jackson has the conditioning, Glaze. This guy will fight you 15 minutes, and he'll fight you 15 more. Right, and you know what? The, maybe the best matchup on the card, we have Tyron Claxton against J.J. Wilson. Claxton, we have seen him with several highlight reel knockouts. Had one slip up there against Emmanuel Sanchez. Let's see what he's learned from that. He won his last fight, but he is such a dynamic fighter. Yeah, and he's a very smart guy, right? When you're a cerebral guy, he's a computer programmer. When you have that ability to stand back and learn and analyze right. yourself, Jay, he's got better since that defeat. Right, J.J. Wilson, he's very, very crafty on the ground. Yeah, you know, uh, so inside baseball here, but I got a little TV uh, accident going on. I hope everybody can hear me. Let's go watch a fight, Jeff. <laughs> Let's go. Cody, put him, put him out of his misery, please. Happy to do so. Taylor, you're doing a great job. Our tail of the tape for our final preliminary matchup brought to you by Boost Mobile's all-new Shrink It Plan, a brand-new way to mobile. Jake Smith, Mark Leminger, here is Michael C. Williams. And now, ladies and gentlemen, tonight here at Bellator 242, we go to the welterweight division, set for three five-minute rounds, introducing the blue corner at six foot one, weighing in 169.8 pounds as a professional. Ten victories, just one defeat. He fights out of Madison, Wisconsin, presenting Mark Leminger. And across the cage, his adversary fighting out of the red corner at 5'9", weighing in 170.3 pounds. His professional record, seven wins, three losses from Vancouver, Washington, Jay, the half-black attack, Smith. And the referee in charge, Kevin McDonald. Kevin McDonald, our referee, Jake Smith, fighting at 170 for the first time inside the Bellator cage. The eighth career fight Ready at fight? 170 fight? pounds. Go. He replaced Logan Storley on eight days notice. Tonight's fight clock brought to you by Geico. Red gloves for Jake Smith and blue gloves for Mark Leminger. Leminger 10 and one as a professional. 15 and one when you combine his perfect amateur record and eclipses his opponent early. Boy, I'll tell you, Jake Smith came out, had a beautiful three-punch combination that landed and landed another one, and then Leminger came and rocked his world. Smith got carried away with the transitions and the punches, and then all of a sudden opened himself up for a nice counter. Jake Smith, also a member of American Top Team Portland. Training with the former champion, Brent Primus, and under the guidance of the great Fabiano Scherner. Head up, head up. Yeah, there we go. There we go. We like that. John, on paper, you like this matchup. You think it's a very closely contended matchup, don't you? I actually do. Lemminger is the guy that has the better wrestling background. But Jake Smith, I have watched this guy so many times, man. He's a gamer and he, you know, he is, I look and say, welterweight's too big of a weight class for him, but he has fought yeah. at heavyweight, light heavyweight, middleweight, welterweight, lightweight. He's fought all over the place. 
You know, he, he has been fighting at lightweight. He took this fight last moment as a welterweight. We'll see how he does without that weight cut and see if that is going to help him, actually, with his skill set. And he said it doesn't matter, short notice. He said, much to your point, John, I've been fighting my whole life. Give me eight days notice. Give me seven or eight seconds notice and enough time to take off my shirt and I'm ready to scrap. That's why I say he's a gamer. There's no doubt about it. I like what he's doing here. He's trying to get that right side underhook because he has that right side half guard. Now he's going to start scooting his hip out to that side. There you go. Just, just exactly what he's doing. He's trying to get his face away from the fence. He can start scooting out to that underhook side. He pulled it out to defend the strike, so now he's holding the head. He needed, he needed to keep that, that right arm underhook. That would have helped him in getting himself out of the position, but everything is little moments. And when you're getting hit, you got to do something to stop those strikes. Main card, top of the hour. Get started with Aaron Pico and Solo Hatley Jr. Our main event has title ramifications, Bandejas and Pettis. You can see that Lemminger likes that half guard positions, a la like a Randy Couture, a guy that clamps down on that leg and says, I'm just going to keep you here, keeping Jake off of the cage, not using the cage so he can get himself back up and just systematically starting to break him down. Well, like Randy used to call it, it's not half guard, it's half mount. So he's like, when I'm on top of you and I'm in your half mount, I'm going to do some damage. And that's exactly what Lemon is doing. The Turk, as the wrestlers like to talk about, and Randy Couture, one of the best at controlling and grinding on his opponents. Well, what I've seen from Lemon is that what he does is he's trying to set up that side choke. So he's in that half guard and that far side side choke, and then he'll drive that knee up into a tripod position and drive it across the knee, across the thigh of Smith, and then he'll get to the top position. That was really a nice job by Jake Smith to try to get him back to a full guard. You saw Mark Leminger just shut it down, push on that leg, get himself back into that half guard position. Mark has a heavy top game, looking for some ground and pound opportunities here with just over a minute on the clock. Well, the big thing that you're seeing and the reason why this is staying where it's at, Lemminger is busy. He is going after doing damage and no one's gonna stop this if he's working at doing damage that is going to diminish his opponent. Well, let me explain to you what the real, what the real reason is, John. <laughs> the real reason why he's on his, what Smith is on his back is his back is flat, and Lemon just keeps putting his back flat to the ground. Every time Smith turns to try to get to, to a underhook side, his back gets put flat to the ground again. He needs to keep to the side position. You can't mount any offense until you're on one side or the other trying to mount some sort of offense. He's on the, on the cage, huh? Right now, you're seeing Lemmer go after that arm triangle choke. Right to Matt. Jake Smith was looking at that. Okay, I'm going to let you, and I'm going to turn and get out of this. And it was the fence that's going to keep that from happening, and that's how Lemmer got right to the mouth. He's going to finish this round either by finishing his opponent or in the full mount position. Good ground and pound here. And a great start for Lemminger. End of the round. Dominant round one for Mark Lemminger making his Bellator debut. So far, it's Josh one, Big John nothing. <laughs> for those of you scoring at home. So what is the score of that round there, Josh? <laughs> It could potentially be a 10 8 round. Well, no, there is no could potentially. It either is or it's not. Yes, it is. There you go. That's what I want to hear. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> Beautiful takedown here by Lemonger. He gets to the top. You notice when he gets to that top position, he tries to push that knee down. He was able to get to the mount position right away. And notice how he's hipping in and locking his feet in that grapevine position there from the top. Nice yeah. job hipping in and making sure he controls the hips of Smith. Real heavy hip pressure right there. John, how would you score round one? I think I would score a 10-8 there, Mike. I'm glad I can help you out with that. <laughs> we need more distance between Josh and John, I think. Well, the two of us need more distance. <laughs> I'm way over somewhere else. 
I'm in my own little world like always. <laughs> Round two. Sorry, you're all happy over there. Man. I'm just glad to be back, as we all are. Blessed to have a great job and be around a great sport, work with a great broadcast team, and watch guys compete inside the Bellator cage. Round two. Mark Leminger, dominant round number one. He's in the blue gloves. Jake Smith, one and one inside the Bellator cage in the red gloves. That was a nice little feint that Jake Smith did, coming with the hook off of it. The whole point is this. Yeah, he lost that round. He, he took some shots, but we're seeing he's still game. He's still in this fight. He's still looking to do damage to Mark Leminger and get himself back to contention in this fight. Nice little short overhand right, came back with a little left hook to the head. He also went to the body earlier, right before that. So that would have had Lemoner drop his hands a little bit, and that would have opened up that left hook to the head. Nicely done, though, by Smith. Jake has huge respect for Chael Sonnen, says he is a great mentor. Said we sit down and have our little chats. It's great to be able to pick his brain. Which I'm thinking, Chael's brain, they've got to be really little chats. Well, right? yeah, I tell you what, he's got to, if he's picking that brain, they're, be that's careful. That's like one little chat. <laughs> I'm glad Chael's mic's closed, because he's. No, no, he's like, he's, 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 right, he's giving me love for that one? All right, fair enough. Thank you, Chael. It's good to do it when his mic is closed, too, as well. Stop. Time. Finger came out of the glove. Cut, man. Jake Smith said, I don't like to leave my house very often. So he actually has thrived in this climate. The less it interaction with cool people, the better. Out, but it's coming out of the, coming out Leminger of the said yeah. that okay. because of everything going on, there were less distractions, which made it easier for okay, him to train. Separate. This is a situation Wait, right okay, here, sure. Mike, that a lot Back of people don't Back understand up. because Ready, if time? that was a finger that was broken and, and he's showing that to the referee, you're going to have a different situation. We had an equipment failure. His finger came out of that glove. That's why when Jake Smith is actually almost calling timeout, it's allowed based upon the equipment failure. These two are throwing. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Because there is no crowd, we can hear the, the breath coming out of their mouth when they're throwing, and we can hear the shots land, even when they land on the shoulders, the back, the, the ribs, whatever it is, you can hear it clean. <laughs> that jab going, jab with them, don't the deep up breaths. The <laughs> yeah. Push them around. The corners. <laughs> Approaching the midway point of our final preliminary fight, top of the hour, we're live on Paramount Network. This is what, you know, it's funny because when you're watching this and you're, you're saying those things about you're hearing the breathing, this is what the referee always hears in every fight. They hear that breathing, they hear the power of the shots, and they hear when the fighters are talking to each other that no one else gets to hear. I thought at your age your hearing was going a little bit. Oh, it has gone. It's gone. Nice job on the takedown, though. He was able to time it over the punch, dropped his, dropped his hips down low below, and then just able to grab the double leg. Right back to that half guard position that he obviously likes and feels that he can be dominant in. Half mount, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> you, you go ahead and change the sport. It's okay. It was Randy. <laughs> Your right side. There you go, crucifix, I like it, try it. Leminger, very yeah, impressive thus far hey, look, look in the his Bellator debut. The so you see how every time Smith tries to turn to his side, Leminger puts a, the cross face on him, put his back flat to the ground again. Yep. That's just body control, keeping his back flat. He's got to turn to his side before he can do anything to mount some sort of offense. And every time you see Jake Smith's right arm on the neck area or over the head of Lemonier, you know he's not going to get out of that position. He's slowly working, I call it three-quarter mount, which is yep. slowly working that left leg Lemonier was to the three-quarter mount, which is throwing his left knee over the thigh of Smith on the other side. So the three-quarter mount would be between the half mount and the full mount. <laughs> Normally that three-quarter mount means that you have actually achieved what looks like mount, but he's still controlling one foot. That's your three-quarter. 
but Josh has now come up with an entirely new system for everyone to learn. Last call, last call. Well, Goldie still hasn't learned the first system. <laughs> oh, now he's boss root. Jake Smith. Now he's boss root at your 50th birthday party, yeah. Josh. <laughs> Lemminger really opened up. He's landing some big shots. Looking to finish it right here, right now. Jake needs to push on those hips. Hip escape out. He can't get there because of the fence. Yeah. It is all over. Congratulations, Mark Lemminger, victorious in his Bellator debut. That was just an outstanding overall performance by Mark Lemminger. You got to love everything he did. He was very calm in the fight. He was relaxed. He had good takedowns. And when he got on top, he was busy and did damage. Well, he knew that Smith wanted to keep it on the feet. So what he did was he got Lemming and Lemminger got Smith to engage in hard striking. And when he did that, he dropped his hips and was able to get the takedown. Top control. Great job. Dominant over Jake Smith tonight. <laughs> so what you saw there was Smith throw the heavy shot because they had just got a new exchange right before that. Lemminger knew that he needed to do that, so he dropped his hips, dropped it on the double leg, finished the takedown right to half guard, and what you see here is the finish. And when you see a guy being able to actually posture up and have that chest off of his opponent and have the hip pressure just being what is keeping him down, it allows you to open up with a lot more power on your shots. It can only take so many before the referee's gonna say that's enough. Here is Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, inside the Bellator cage, it comes to an end officially. Four minutes, 46 seconds, round at number two. The winner by TKO, Mark Lellinger. Congratulations, Mark Lemminger. Welcome to Bellator, Jay and Chael. He'll take us off the air here with our preliminary action. We'll see you top of the hour on Paramount. Jay. All right, thanks, Goldie. Right, and that starts in about 10 minutes on Paramount. Chell, we start that card with Aaron Pico, Solo Hatley. Aaron Pico, we all thought was one of the best prospects we have seen coming to mixed martial arts. One thing we couldn't tell was how is his chin? Not so good, but the skills are there. Yeah, Jay, and the only thing that I would push back on Aaron is, is, is his strategy. I mean, listen, this is a world-class wrestler. He was a world champion in the cadet division, but he also was a Golden Gloves boxer. Right. And Jay, he wants to go out there. He used to spar with Manny Pacquiao. He used to be trained by Freddie Roach. I mean, he went out there and did some stuff that I don't know is in his his wheelhouse. I think he needs to grab his opponents. I think he needs to slow that pace down just a little bit. And by talking to him yesterday, that's exactly what he says he's going to do. Yeah, good. Again, the big thing here is, can he take that punch, whether it's from Hatley or somebody else? Obviously, against Pico, Hatley has a puncher's chance. He's also standing by with our own Jim Brown. Well, thanks, Jay. I'm here backstage with Aaron Pico Jr. He's the first fight of the night on our card on Paramount. Now, Aaron, when we talked with you this week, there was like a noticeable difference, this maturity, a calmness. You said that you have fallen in love with MMA. What does that mean? Well, before, I mean, I've always enjoyed MMA, but there's been uh, some ups and downs, and, and you really find out if you like the sport or not when stuff doesn't go your way. And uh, fortunately for me, after that, I just fell more in love with uh, fighting, and I'm excited to show my skills tonight. Well, tonight will be your uh, third fight under uh, join, since joining Jackson Winks, that is. Yeah. Uh, what are we going to see different from you inside the cage tonight? Well, I never want to lose my my uh, aggress aggressiveness. I, I mean, it's I just want to go out there and show my skills and relax and, and, and ultimately just have fun. I put a lot of pressure on myself, but I have all the skills in the world, and I just need to go out there, relax, and 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 basically just have fun. Now your opponent tonight, yeah. so Hatley Jr. I know you watched some tape on him. What did you see that you think you can exploit tonight? Well, he's a very, very strong wrestler, and I think a lot of people forget that I'm, the, I'm a three-time world medalist in wrestling. I was on the Olympic alternate for the United States, so I, I know how to wrestle. I think I know a few things. But uh, for me, if I just stay relaxed, do what I do, um, it's not going to be an easy night. It's going to be a very tough night, but I, I just want to go out there and, and uh, compete. Well, we look forward to seeing what a relaxed Aaron Pico looks like inside the cage. Good I luck tonight. It. Thank you. Still a great prospect, a fantastic young man as well. He leads off our card here tonight over on Paramount in about six minutes from now. Tawan Claxton, J.J. Wilson. Oh, I think that's the matchup of the night. 
Jordan Meehan, he has been around for a long time against Jason Jackson, Ricky Bendejas against Sergio Pettis. The winner of that fights for the title. Folks, it took us 134 days to get back here, but we are here tonight on Paramount. Five minutes, fights coming your way. The big fights you've craved Good night. are back. Here we go. Next, live and free on Paramount Network, two of Bellator's top bantamweight contenders, Sergio Pettis and Ricky Bandejas, battle to earn their shot at the title. Plus, two of MMA's human highlight reels, Aaron Pico and Taiwan Claxton return to the cage. It's good to be back. Bellator MMA, live next on Paramount Network. You good for mommy, all right? Definitely different from the airport on. You're, everybody's wearing the mask, you know? You tell everybody's all paranoid at the airport. It's a whole different feel, you know? It's a whole different uh, experience. It's my first time traveling during this COVID uh, whole thing. So going there, uh, seeing everybody wear the mask and just how uh, how strict they are on social distancing, you know, it was a lot different. This fight week's been different. You know, normally I get here and, and um, sign the papers, check weight, and go to the store, get all my food and water. But now we got here, get tested, and, and sitting in the room and waiting for the results. Uh, get into Mohegan Suns, you know, straight to the room, man. Got tested. Been in the room ever since. So, um, you know, just chilling, set up my PS4, get my gaming on, and just chilling and waiting to see uh, what's next. Yeah, so right now we are doing the oral pharyngeal swabs of the fighters in their corners. And so what Diana, who's a nurse here, does, she just takes a couple of cells basically from the back of their throat, which we're gonna send back to the lab to process to make sure all the guys are COVID negative and just administrative work just to make sure that the individual swabs match the actual guys who are doing the testing and so that they will be cleared to go and so we can have a kick-ass event tomorrow night. What's up guys, Victoria Gracie here. Um, welcome to Fight Week. We have our fighters taking temperature checks today. All corners are in their own designated area. In between all workouts, we're wiping down. We are making sure that these fighters have their own locker room, own workout areas all day long, um, and, and also cut weight with their own sauna in their own area with their corners. So in these uncertain times, our main focus is to keep these fighters as safe as possible in the fight sphere, keeping them as distant as possible until they're able to get into the cage and able to fight safely. Just got checked in with Bellator, did all the pre-fight stuff. Um, and I'm in this MT arena just checking out where I'll be fighting this Friday. Very excited. Uh, you know, it's a lot different than what I'm used to. Uh, usually a crowd, usually uh, no masks. You know, it's, uh, it's a whole different fight vibe out here, but it's interesting. It's uh, the new normal, so it's something I'm gonna have to get used to for this year, and uh, hopefully we all can get past this. If you want to be the best or be a champion, you gotta, you know, adapt, whether it's in fighting or, or just in fight week. Not everything goes as planned. You know, so you gotta be ready for what, whatever turns you take. This fight's gonna show Ricky where he's at, and it's gonna show me where I'm at in this division. I, I've been around for a while. I've been fighting some of the top level athletes, so uh, I believe for this fight, you know, if, if he makes adjustments, he could have a good night, but he's gonna have to make a lot of adjustments. I feel I'm just years ahead of this man every way possible, so it's gonna be a, it's gonna be an interesting fight for both of us. Um, whoever can make the adjustments will come out successful, and personally, I think it's me. Uh, this is my first main event, you know, it means a lot. When you start this journey as an MMA fighter, you know, your ultimate goal is the belt and to be a main event. You know, the circumstances are definitely different, but I'm super excited to be, uh, you know, headlining the card. You know, hopefully one more step to my goal, which is Bantamweight champ on Bellator. Glad to get back to work. Glad to be back at Bellator. Glad to be the first fight at Bellator, headlining the first fight. So, definitely a blessing. This shows his character. He's happy about missing weight. Who's happy about missing weight? You miss weight? Oh, 
What's up, Bellator fam? It's that time. You know what time it is. That's a wrap. Everything's done. You know, I'm just going to go to the room, relax, watch some TV, and last thing on the list is fight. <laughs> <laughs>